So every year, right around Thanksgiving, that was a couple weeks ago, I think, I can't remember, but um, I get super pumped. Like Black Friday is like Christmas songs all day, right? So I get super pumped for Christmas, like right after Thanksgiving, it's right there. I won't celebrate Christmas before Thanksgiving. I'm not one of those people. Some people, November 1st, the tree goes up. I'm just not that person. But um, I will say, thanks to the living Christmas tree, I already had some quality Christmas music ringing in my head since like the beginning of August. So that's great. That's great. But it, it is right around this time of year where I get excited for Christmas season because we celebrate the birth of Christ. We get to give gifts to all of our loved ones. That's my favorite part. I love giving gifts. I don't know what it is about it. I just like giving people really nice gifts. But I would have to say, Christmas is probably my favorite time of the year because the music is top notch. Like, it's just up there. Probably some of the best music I've ever heard in my life. I mean, let's talk. Like, you got Oh Come All You Faithful, The Little Drummer Boy. That's probably my favorite. Play my drums for him. That's my favorite. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Like, these songs are amazing. But for some reason, my birthday is December 14th, and always by the time I get to my birthday, it's like Christmas started, and I was all about it. We're going to celebrate Jesus. Jesus is on his way. It's going to be great. All is well. And then my birthday comes, and I'm singing, Joy to the world. Santa Claus is coming to town. Like, why is it that it's so easy for me to be so excited to celebrate Jesus? And the world creeps in with their cultural Christmas and pulls me over to this cultural holiday. And I can tell you that it's because every human being, regardless of religion, race, sex, any of that, is a worshiper. Through and through, we are created to be worshipers. We all worship something. And if we don't truly seek and worship Christ in the Christmas season, we will worship something else entirely. This morning, we're going to look at a popular passage in Scripture about the Christmas season and learn what it means to truly seek and find Jesus in this season. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. It's on page 807 of your Black Pew Bible. If you don't own a Bible, as Pastor Jim says every week, and I will relay the message, that Black Pew Bible is now yours. You own it. It's a free gift from Oak Grove Baptist Church. All we ask is that you read it and obey it. And every time you open it, just remember, it's because we love you. It's because we love you. So if you're able, please stand as we read the word of God. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this story, this uh, Christmas, God. It's about nothing but you. Your son is the most important gift of all, most important gift of eternity. And God, I praise you for him. Pray that you use this service as a way to glorify you. But God, I pray that the words I speak would not be my own, but I would just be a mouthpiece of you. So just let this word, this truth, this Bible, this scripture, 
just pierce the hearts of those in this, this room today and just let this service be about nothing but you. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you may be seated. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. You guys got the memo. So what I kind of want to do here is I really love this scripture, and there's some important characters in this scripture, and I kind of want to do a little bit of a character analysis, if you will. We're not going to dive super deep, but we're just kind of going to look at three characters or groups of characters. So in looking at three specific characters or groups of characters in this story, we'll find that all people are either worshipers of God or they are worshipers of themselves. So everyone in this story, from the wise men to the, to the um, scribes to Herod, they're all worshipers, believe it or not. And we're going to get into that. And we're going to find out what it means to truly worship. So first, the wise men are said to have come from the east. Well, that doesn't give us much information, but the land east of Jerusalem was in the direction of Babylon and ancient Persia. And there is a major connection between the Magi or the wise men from here and the coming of the Messiah. Has anyone here heard of a guy named Daniel? Yeah, he's pretty popular. He had some experience sharing a bedroom with lions. Um, But he was appointed to having authority over all the royal Magi after interpreting King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. King Nebuchadnezzar said, you are wiser than all of my wise men and gave him authority over them. Now, this is also the same man who foretold the coming of the Messiah. So, with all that being said, these magi were not unfamiliar with the prophecy of Jesus. They knew this was important. They knew that Jesus wasn't just going to be another baby. He wasn't just going to be another false prophet. He was going to be the one that God had promised from the moment of the fall. One important thing to notice when we read this passage, it's important to note that the star did not lead the wise men directly to Bethlehem. They don't wonder, like, why? Wouldn't it be, like, easier to just go to Bethlehem and not have to encounter Herod at all? I mean, he is, like, a liar and a manipulator and a murderer, all those things. Like, why would God send the star, take them to Jerusalem before Bethlehem? There's an important encounter in Jerusalem that teaches us a lesson about God's sovereignty. When they arrived in Jerusalem, the wise men asked the question, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, for me, when I read this, this question seems like a valid question. They were told to follow a star find the Messiah. So they follow the star to Jerusalem. From what they know, they could be looking for the Messiah there. So they're asking. And the, the, the strange thing, and the thing that really makes me scratch my head, this was a city filled with people, Jerusalem, a city filled with people who should have been overjoyed to hear the news of the infant Messiah. This is Jerusalem we're talking about. Instead, what does the Bible say? They were troubled. Why would a city like this be troubled that the Messiah was here? The difference is the wise men weren't exactly sure. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. They weren't exactly sure where the Messiah was, but they knew why he had come. The Messiah had come as a child and was special, and they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's all that mattered. Now the scribes and everyone in Jerusalem knew where he'd be, but they didn't know why he was there. They didn't really believe it in their heart. Otherwise, would they really have been troubled? The magi, the wise men, they were willing to travel hundreds of miles to simply worship. Just a show of hands, who here would drive like 300 miles to go to church on a Sunday morning? Well, the Magi walked over on camel's backs and they walked, hun- they went hundreds of miles. It was not like a day's journey, a couple hours journey. It was like probably at least a few weeks 
Like, this was not an easy process. And if you notice, all through this passage, all the magi, the wise men, all they wanted to do, their whole driving force of their endeavors was simply, we want to worship the newborn king. That's all we want. Hundreds of miles just to worship. Another important thing to notice about this passage is that the wise men were seeking to worship the child, Jesus, but notice how the scripture doesn't mention anything about singing, music, songs. It doesn't mention that at all. It does say the wise men fell on their faces and worshiped him, but that doesn't automatically imply that they were singing victory in Jesus in Bethlehem. All the Bible says is that they were there to worship, and that's the only reason they came. They wanted to worship him. They were true worshipers of Christ in giving of their time, their energy, and their treasures to God, and their only motive. They gave their time, their energy, their treasures, and their only motive was to find Jesus. They only wanted to find Jesus. This, I think this is a very important lesson for us as believers. They only wanted to find Jesus. So moving on to character group number two, we're going to talk about the scribes. Scribes come into the picture when Herod is kind of having a little panic session. And he says, oh, what's this? What's this going on? My authority is being threatened. The Messiah is here. So he gets together a little group meeting and asks a couple questions. So the scribes in this passage like the wise men, were also worshipers of something. Unfortunately, their worship was directed more towards their own agendas than God's. Let's take a minute to talk about the scribes. So a scribe, they, they were experts on the scriptures. They were in close proximity to where all of this went down, where it took place. And they had the promises that this was going to happen but none of that made them move at all. These guys knew the scriptures. Remember, they just had the Old Testament at this point. They knew the scriptures front to back. They knew all the promises of God. They knew the Messiah was coming. And yet when the Messiah, when the wise men went and asked where the Messiah was, all they were was trouble. The, scribe, the scribes remained stagnant, even though they had all of this access knowledge, and proximity. So Herod called together the high priests and scribes in Jerusalem to have what we would call today a staff meeting about this child Messiah. The scribes were well aware of the movement of God, but neglected to adjust themselves to God's will. This is one of the key and the heart reasons why we're doing, just finished, still in the process of studying experience in God. I think these scribes were still stuck in that mindset of, I'm going to pray and ask God what his will for my life is, rather than praying and saying, hey, God, what is your will for me? What is your will? So many of us say, God, what is your will for my life? When in reality, we should be saying, God, show me your will, period. And please help me to adjust my life so that I can join you in that will. It's not, we have to adjust this me mindset of God, what are you doing with me? And just adjust it from us to God and say, God, what are you doing? Use me in it. I think the scribes were stuck in that me mindset. Yeah, so unfortunately, this is the way many of us react when God answers prayers or fulfills promises. It's very important that when we pray, we don't just pray because we think we should. Or we pray because we think it's, you know, we need something. There's like two, there's like, there's like some, some people like pray in the highs and give God the glory. And then they pray in the lows when they really need God. But in the middle, in that day to day, it's kind of just like, okay, whatever. But when we pray, we should pray expectantly because God is always hearing us. He's always answering prayers. 
Even if he says no, he's going to hear you and he's going to do something about it. And same thing with his promises. God fulfills every one of his promises. And when God says Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back. So we should live every day of our lives expecting Jesus to come back on the clouds to come and return. It's all about being expectant and not just finding ourselves stagnant in this word because this word is not just a book. It's living and active and it applies every day all the time. Now back to the scribes. In this circumstance, whether they were in fear of Herod or driven by other circumstances when they didn't move, the scribes were worshipers of themselves rather than God. Now on to the last character I want to look at, Herod. Now contrary to popular belief, believe it or not, Herod was probably one of the most passionate worshipers of this passage. He worshipped from the moment he got up in the morning to the moment he went to sleep. He worshipped 24-7. But his worship was directed only toward himself. If we look later on in this chapter, Herod was so threatened by this baby Jesus. He went into Bethlehem and had every, chi- every male child ages two and under killed because he didn't want his God, the man he saw in the mirror, to be taken off the throne. And I I really don't like to say this, but unfortunately many of us fall into this habit of self-worship. We become our own God. Our worship services take place in the mornings when we look in the mirror. That's not what we're designed to do. We become so infatuated with our own well-being and desires that we start to excuse actions that we never would have before. And this is a big thing that's always talked about when we mention addiction. It doesn't have to be addiction to a substance. It can be addiction to, you know, a, a video game. It can be addiction to, you know, your phone, social media. But what we start to do is we become so infatuated with our own desires and our own habits that we start to say, hey, like, I want to do this, so I'm just going to let that slide. For example, when when, when you're first saved, you have this new relationship with the Holy Spirit. A fire is is lit inside your soul, and you are so on fire for Jesus because you've never felt this way before. The Holy Spirit's in you. You're ready to go. You're ready to fight. You're ready to pursue the calling that God has called you to. And this question is directed at myself at one time or another. But what I, if I asked you would, you, would you have really missed that outreach event for the big game when you were first saved? When we worship ourselves and our desires, it is impossible to be a true worshiper of Jesus Christ. So we're looking at all the three of these characters, Who of all these characters were worshipers of God and not themselves? Herod is obviously not it. Herod is all about Herod. That's it. Let's think of the scribes. They stood there and did nothing. What an atrocious self-contradiction that the scribes should have all the knowledge and remain still. This is just as bad as if a person knows all about Christ and his teachings and his own life expresses the opposite. And I know as soon as I said that, there was probably one person you thought of. They proclaim Christ. They've come forward. They've been baptized. They're a member of the church. But what do they do outside of Sunday? And unfortunately, this hypocritical action, this, this by Christians, that's kind of the reason people aren't Christians. If, like, if, if we truly want to pursue Christ with everything we are, we will pursue Christ Sunday through Saturday and not just wait for the following Sunday. David Peterson, he's the author of a book called Engaging with God, a biblical theology of worship. He defines worship in this way. Worship is an engagement with God in the Holy Spirit, a Christ-centered 
gospel-serving life orientation. Let me say that again. A Christ-centered, gospel-serving life orientation. Will you just stay still like the scribes or will you move like the wise men with open hearts, attentive lives, and worshipful commitment? And dare I ask, will you be like Herod whose response to the Savior was fearful and aggressive, even violent and destructive? I want to challenge all of you to worship God in the way you live your life, the things you invest your time in, and the treasures and the, and the things you invest your treasures into. And most importantly, the way you seek Jesus. And just for the unbeliever here today, you were created to worship. You might not know Jesus, but you were created to worship. That might be hard to believe, but I'm going to tell you right now, you've been worshiping yourself for too long. You were created to worship the creator of the universe. God made all of creation to worship him. Psalm 66.4 says, All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Think about it. You go outside. On a windy day, you hear the wind whistling by. That creation, that wind whistles in worship of God. The trees sway. The leaves rustle. God created those trees to worship him. You go, you see the river rushing, you hear it, this mighty power of water that can kill you if, if you get lost in it. And God holds that power in his hand and the river still worships him. All of creation, and guess what? You're part of that creation and you were designed to worship God for all of eternity. Jesus Christ entered this world as a baby in a manger. He lived a life we couldn't. I, I, I hate to break it to any of you, but just like me, we're all sinners. Your parents didn't have to teach you to say mine. I'm sure someday I'll have to teach Shiloh not to say mine. <laughs> but uh, but you're, we're all born sinners. We inherit this sin. And the great thing about Jesus is he was born he didn't only humble himself to a cross, he humbled himself to a manger first. He came into a world and he was laid to rest in a hay with animals. The king of the world, the creator of everything. He was one of the people in Genesis who said, we should make man in our own image. And he's here laying in a manger in hay. So we live a life we couldn't and died the death we should have. Because the wages of sin is death. God can't be around in perfection. But he made a way so that we, that we, imperfect, could be with him forever. So he died the death we should have so that we can have eternity to worship God. Let me tell you this. You just worship God this morning and for those of you maybe... I hope you accept Christ today, but if you accept Christ today, your worship starts today, and it doesn't just last 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years until the day you die. Your worship, your, your, your eternity starts the moment you say yes to Jesus. You say yes to Christ, and you worship forever. And let me tell you, the choirs in heaven are going to sound way better than this tree. This tree sounds awesome. But if you guys are coming to see this, the choirs in heaven, whew, I can't wait to hear. Can't wait to just worship God literally forever. Can you imagine when we've been there 10,000 years? What even is 10,000 years? Can anybody tell me? I don't know. What the year is it? 2000? 2023? I can't. We've been there to, anyway. That's another that's a story for another time. But he lived a life we couldn't, died the death we should have, so that you can have eternity to worship God alone. So I want to end here with this. Entering into this Christmas season, the true purpose of Christmas is so we can celebrate the birth of Christ, the perfect gift 
the only gift that really eternally matters. So entering into this Christmas season, now is the time to turn your worship to the only one who is worthy of your worship. Not to anything of this world, not to any cultural anything. Jesus came into the world, lived perfectly, died a sinner's death, and rose again, defeated death, so that you could live forever with him. Please, worship only Christ this season. Seek Jesus and let that be your only goal as we approach the day we celebrate his birth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for who you are and what you do. You are so good. And God, you are so worthy of worship in every way. You never cease to amaze us. And God, I just pray that this truth of worshiping you would convict us to not only come on Sunday morning ready to worship. Yes, we should come to church ready to worship, ready to participate in something that both is for edification and adoration. But God, convict us to live lifestyles life orientations of worship to you. Every conversation we have, every swipe we make on our cell phones, every phone call we make, every contact we have, let that time, let that energy, let that gift be dedicated to you in worship of you. So God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this amazing, wonderful day. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If the Spirit's moving in your heart today, I would, I would encourage you to come forward, whatever you need. Whether you've accepted Christ and, and you want to start your worshiping right here and now, we're about to play a song that is great for that. But I challenge you, Come forward if the Spirit's moving in you. If you want to accept Christ, come see one of the staff down front. We'll pray with you. We'll worship with you. And if you just, you're having a rough time, stuff's going on, because stuff's always going on. Come forward, we'll pray with you. Anything you need. You'll be baptized. I know this tree's in the way, but we'll be baptizing soon. So we'll get you baptized. So just come forward as the Spirit leads.